Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, first session of the last but one day of the Nankind Symposium. So it's a pleasure to have Ning Su today from University of Pisa talking about conformal bootstrap and critical phenomena. Please, Ning. Thanks for the introduction, uh, and uh, thanks for inviting me to give a talk. Today, I want to tell you about the uh, latest uh, development in conform bootstrap and uh, its application to critical phenomena. Uh, let me start by scale environment system. Uh, we see many examples in uh, nature. Uh, and uh, uh, now we want to study uh, QFT with uh, scale invariance. Uh, that happens uh, uh, at the criticality. The simplest example is the uh, Ising model. It's described by this Hamiltonian. Uh, at lower temperature, it's in ordered phase, and higher temperature in disordered phase. In between, at a certain critical temperature, the system have still uh, invariance. And uh, actually, uh, uh, the scale invariance uh, emerge to conformal invariance. So we call the uh, QFT with conformal invariance uh, uh, conformal field theory. Uh, when the system close to the critical temperature, we can measure uh, quantities like heat capacity. And uh, uh, we say uh, uh, power law divergence. Uh, the power uh, is uh, called critical exponent. So, uh, it is related to the uh, compute those. Uh, so ice model has been studied for one and two dimension is exactly solved by Onsak in 1944. But two dimen uh, but in three dimension, uh, we don't uh, have exact uh, solution. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's a holy grail problem. Uh, so why three dimension? So difficult. Uh, in two dimension, we have the Versorial symmetry. Uh, all the patient of the Versorial uh, algebra. So uh, in this way, uh, actually the fusion rule is finite. This is a fusion rule for two dimensional uh, IC model. So only finite number of field enter the uh, theory. But in three dimension, uh, the Versorial symmetry is uh, broken. Uh, therefore, the field cannot be organized uh, into Versorial representation. Uh, the consequences uh, is, uh, are that uh, uh, in the fusion rule, there will be infinite number of uh, uh, quasi-conformal uh, primary uh, appear. So for, for example, in uh, sigma, uh, sigma OPE, the infinite number of terms. So it cannot be solved uh, algebraically. Uh, how do I study those theory traditionally? Uh, it seems to me there are two traditional approach. One approach is that we, uh, uh, we know uh, in continuum limit, the, the theory is described by free theory, uh, by the five-fold Lagrangian, and uh, mm, at four dimensions, free theory. Uh, now we start uh, from the uh, free theory, uh, flow to the uh, 3D interacting icing CFT, and we expand the quantity in three-dimensional three icing CFT. In terms of uh, the small perturbation parameter, which is the four minus space-time dimension. So uh, the problem is that this quantity is actually not small. Uh, epsilon is one. If you really write down the uh, expansion, it actually diverge. Uh, 
Last way we can do is uh, we can simulate a uh, uh, lattice model uh, and uh, uh, let the UV uh, lattice theory flow to I of its point. Uh, it seems for me the traditional method doesn't universally work for every problem and uh, for each problem it has its own difficulties. Uh, so I would like to have a new approach. Uh, maybe a better starting point for 3D CFT is that perhaps we should study the, uh, the model exactly at IR and uh, uh, non-perturbatively. So uh, we try to not use any UV's information and we try to not use any information from the Lagrangian. Uh, essentially, this is the idea of conform bootstrap. We try to use consistency conditions to constrain, directly constrain the IR CFT without resorting to the UA detail or large range. So uh, how does this possible? Uh, uh, now let me quickly go through the uh, constraint for conformal field theory. There are a few constraints. First one is that we assume um, uh, uh, the operator uh, are representations of the conform group. So they are labeled by two quantum number. One is the, the spin, which is the quantum num number for the Euclidean group. The other one is the, the scaling uh, dimension. So we have infinite number of operators uh, uh, like this. And uh, let me remind you, the scaling dimension is uh, uh, related to the critical exponent, which can be measured in each experiment. Okay, second assumption is that we assume uh, there is a uh, uh, OP uh, product dark state expansion. It means uh, when we multiply two operators, it, uh, it can be expanded in terms of uh, all the operators in the theory. And uh, uh, there is a, uh, over, uh, uh, for each operator, there is a coefficient uh, uh, for it. It's called OP coefficient. So once we assume this expansion, we can use uh, this expansion to evaluate uh, any endpoint correlators. For example, for four point correlator, we can use this expansion to uh, fuse uh, first the two operator. Uh, so we, uh, we use this again to fuse uh, uh, next the two operator. Uh, and uh, uh, the result is a summation over some intermediate operator K. Uh, but now we have two ways to do it. We can first fuse one and two, then three and four. Or we can fuse one and four, and then fuse two and three. Uh, in order for the, in order for this multiplication rule to be consistent, uh, these two different ways to do it must uh, equal. So if we really write down this equation, uh, we get an equation like like this. Uh, so in this situation, it's the summation over uh, all the operators appear in the OPE. So O should appear in, uh, in uh, O1 and O2 OPE. Uh, and this C is the uh, OPE uh, coefficient. Uh, it's a real number. This F is called the convolved conformal block. It's a known function. Uh, it's completely fixed by uh, conformal symmetry. Function depends on the space-time coordinate. Uh, and this function, uh, this can be so uh, now what is the constraint? So, so what does uh, those conditions tell us? This condition, those conditions tell us uh, a consistent CFT uh, 
are a set of quantity consist of OPE coefficient and the deltas. And those uh, quantity has to satisfy equation like this. Uh, of course, there are one equation for every four-point function. And we can write down infinite number of four-point functions. So we actually have infinite number of equations like this. So we call those equation bootstrap equation. Uh, okay, so uh, now we can say equations like this are very, very difficult uh, because the infinite terms in the equation and the infinite number of undetermined parameters. So uh, at first glance, you might uh, say, oh, well, it's just so many degree of freedom. It seems uh, uh, we cannot extract anything out of it. But, uh, but actually we can, we do able to extract something out of it. Uh, so how, how do we use those equations? Uh, now let me, uh, let me consider a special case. Now let me assume those four operators are, are the same and they are a spin zero operator, so they are scalars. So in this case, uh, since one, two, three, four are the same, uh, let me rewrite the equation in this way. So lambda phi phi O is the, uh, is the OP coefficient. Uh, and we know this is uh, real for unitary CFT. Therefore, the uh, square of the OP coefficient is positive. So now let's think about this uh, equation. Oh, by the way, uh, U and V uh, can be expressed in terms of uh, space-time coordinate. So, the, uh, uh, so F is a function uh, in uh, variable U and V. And uh, we have uh, an infinite summation of those uh, f uh, with the positive coefficient and the result on the right hand side is zero. So how does this possible? Um, now uh, let me, uh, so we can use new matches to extract the constraint from this equation. Uh, how to do it? First, uh, let me first truncate this function to a finite vector. Let me just take uh, n derivative uh, and uh, I cut off the derivative uh, to some, uh, let's say maximum derivative is a uh, lambda. So now this function become a finite dimensional vector. Uh, those vectors are uh, from the coefficient of the Taylor expansion. Okay, uh, so, so now what does this equation tells you? This equation tells you, uh, you sum up uh, uh, infinite number of vectors with positive coefficient and uh, the result is uh, zero. Okay, so uh, I can try to draw, uh, okay, uh, now let's, uh, Consider a simplified case. Uh, now let me assume those vectors are uh, three-dimensional vector. And uh, let me try to draw uh, the, the vector in three dimension. So I can ask myself, if I draw those vector uh, in three dimension, does it look like this or does it look like uh, uh, this? You can say on the left hand side, uh, it's, in, uh, uh, it's impossible. Um, uh, so, so on the right hand side, I can find a plan such that all the vectors are on one side of the plan. So if this is the case, it's impossible uh, uh, for me to sum those vectors up with positive coefficient and get zero. Because uh, uh, they must have a non-zero component in the normal direction of the plan. But on the other hand, if the situation is the left hand side, uh, then it's possible I sum this vector up and I get zero uh, with positive coefficient. So, uh, so uh, 
in in other, uh, let me change the language a little bit. Actually, what I want to find is that I want to find a function now acting on this function, gave me a positive number. Uh, and I want, to, uh, I want to ask if it's possible to find such function, such that it acting on those function uh, are all positive. If such function exists, then I let this function acting on the equation. On the left hand side, it's, uh, uh, it gives me a positive number, but on the right hand side, it gives me zero. So uh, I conclude, uh, I find a contradiction. So for this equation cannot hold. Uh, if I can't find such function, uh, then it's possible this function can be held. So uh, I call this uh, feasible case. And if I find this function, I call it in feasible case. So I will call this feasibility test. And uh, I want to emphasize, uh, if you find such function, the infeasibility is actually rigorous because uh, uh, even though we uh, truncate this, uh, 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 we project this infinite dimensional uh, function to finite dimensional vector space. But if we, we can rule out this equation in finite dimension, of course, we can also rule out the, uh, the original equation. So the infeasibility is actually rigorous. Uh, so, this is probably the most difficult uh, technical part of my talk. Is there any questions uh, at this moment? How many terms do you usually consider typically? Uh, you mean the dimension of the vector space? Yes, what's the size, yeah. Uh, we can do uh, very high vector, uh, very high dimensional vector space, like uh, uh, a few hundreds. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we uh, we are still trying to improve the numerics, and in future we might be able to do more. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, so uh, now let me show a real example. Uh, so uh, here I only discussed uh, a simple case. It's uh, it's a four-point function for uh, identical four scalars, but uh, it's the same if we uh, consider more uh, correlators. So let's consider the correlator sigma. Uh, uh, sigma is the spin operating IC model absolutely. It's the energy operating item model. Let's consider the constraint from those uh, bootstrap equations, and uh, we can uh, we can do something like this. We can deform it to a feasibility test, and the feasibility test like this can be solved by semi-definite program. Uh, so, what is the result? The result is uh, uh, this plot. So in this plot, uh, the horizontal axis is uh, the scaling dimension of sigma. Vertical axis is the scaling dimension of epsilon. And uh, here we see a very small island. So outside of the island in those white region, we can explicitly, explicitly construct this functional alpha. Uh, only in the inside of the island, we cannot construct such alpha. So it's possible for IC model to live inside, but uh, outside it's completely 100% ruled out. Okay, so this is by far the most precise result for uh, 3D IC model. And it's done in uh, 2016 by those authors. Uh, so uh, now we want to ask, uh, uh, this is a su successful story for IC model. Can we do it for more uh, CFTs? Uh, yes, we can. So uh, this is uh, my work with my collaborator, uh, Jun Chen Zhong. Uh, we consider a slightly more complicated model, which is the three dimension n, n equals to one super IC model. Uh, in two dimensions, this model is actually uh, the next simplest minimal model. 
So in 2D, the simplest minimal model is the Eisen model, uh, M34. And the next simplest one is M45, which is the uh, n cross to one super Eisen model. So this model exists in, in 3D. So we consider the uh, uh, four-point function uh, of sigma, 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 sigma. Oh, sorry, here, um, uh, sigma is this phi. So I should, uh, yeah. So sigma means this phi. Uh, and we put in uh, supersymmetric constraint. Uh, and uh, we find this uh, nice island. And uh, here you can see this is the critical exponent uh, uh, measured from this island. So the size of the island gives you the uh, error bar. And the error bar is, is uh, solid. So there is no statistical error. Uh, outside this error bar, it's 100% ruled out. And uh, 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 a, a, a interesting aspect of this model is that uh, the condensed matter physicists that conjecture this model might be able to realize in uh, a condensed matter system, which does not have UV supersymmetry. Uh, so the reason is that uh, uh, they conjecture there are only one relevant singlet in this theory. Therefore, it's possible you tune the system, uh, you tune the temperature of the system and reach the uh, supersymmetric fixed point, uh, even though the uh, UV uh, system does not have supersymmetry. So this is called the emergent uh, uh, supersymmetry. So this is quite interesting. Maybe we can actually discover supersymmetry in condensed matter instead of high energy physics. Uh, okay, so what else can we do? Uh, we also studied uh, the Owen Vect model. Uh, uh, those model actually started uh, in uh, 2015. Uh, uh, by considering the, uh, all the four-point function involve phi and phi square. But uh, the problem in, uh, in the previous study is that they did not find a convergent island. They find a big island. But uh, when you increase the precision of the numerics, it seems the island stop uh, shrinking. So we want to say how to solve it. Uh, one idea is that we can put in more operator. So we want to study uh, this phi, which is on vector, and phi square is on singlet. Uh, now we also want to include one more operator, which is the uh, Owen traceless symmetric tensor. Uh, so uh, it's a simple idea uh, why people did not do, do it uh, before. The reason is that uh, once you include more and more operators, you have the curse of dimensionality. Basically, uh, for the feasibility test, you have to scan the, the, the space. Uh, for example, for, for, for this uh, study, you have to scan the parameter uh, delta uh, sigma and delta epsilon. So for each point, you have to do the test and try to ask if you can find the functional alpha or not. So uh, this is a 2D scan. Uh, but uh, uh, when you uh, include more and more operators, you have to scan a space that have larger and larger uh, dimension. So for example, in O2 case, if we want to mix the uh, uh, vector scalar and trace the symmetric tensor, uh, the dimension we need to scan is uh, six dimension. We have to scan three uh, scaling dimensions and the three OPE coefficients. So in order to find the island, we have to scatter a lot of points in this uh, space and try to test whether each point is feasible or not. So uh, as dimension increase, you have to test more and more points. And uh, that um, 
so an IEW estimation is that, uh, that that would cost millions. Uh, and uh, still, uh, this might not work after you're burning uh, millions. Why? Because uh, uh, let's say if you don't, after you test so many points, if you don't find the island, it's still possible a small island exists between two points. So it might, uh, it may not work. Uh, okay, so uh, now uh, my contribution, uh, one of my contributions is that I invented a new algorithm, which is very efficient uh, for the scan problem in the OP space. So uh, this one and this one in the OP space, the scan problem now become very easy. Uh, this is a bit technical, but uh, Basically, the observation is that uh, once you try, try to find the functional alpha for one point, this functional actually exclude uh, a large chunk of volume in the OP space. Therefore, if you keep track of the functionals, uh, uh, you can actually rule out the uh, space uh, in some finite step. And uh, uh, this is actually quite efficient. The time is uh, linear to number of OPs, and it's uh, also deterministic. Basically, it means uh, uh, if there is a feasible point in the theory, we will be able to find it. So now this solves the same problem in the OP space. Uh, then for O2, it become uh, again three-dimensional problem. For O3, it's uh, now three-dimensional problem, and uh, now it's doable. So. Uh, the analog is that the feasibility test is like a bullet. We test one point and we excluded that point. Uh, the new algorithm is uh, like, uh, like a bomb. Once you test one point, it excludes uh, uh, a large space. So it's much more efficient. So we use this to study the O3, uh, O2 model, which the result uh, uh, is on the left, and the O3 model, the result is on the right. Uh, and uh, we obtained, uh, for O2 and O3, we obtained a very accurate, accurate result. So here you see a multiple island. It's labeled by the truncation of the derivatives. So the smallest island is our best result. Uh, so what kind of physics can we learn from those, uh, uh, those computation? For O2 models, uh, that's actually an interesting question. So uh, in 1992, uh, on the shuttle, uh, uh, Space Shuttle Columbia, uh, people measured the, uh, people did the helium-4 superfluid experiment. Uh, the superfluid, uh, helium for superfluid experiment at the uh, superfluid phase transition, the phase point is actually described by the O2 model. So uh, when you measure the heat capacity, you can extract the critical exponent. And uh, the critical exponent is related to the scaling dimension of the singlet. Okay, so in this plot, the the red line and the red dashed line is from the helium for superfluid experiment on the space shuttle. Uh, and the green box is uh, the result from Monte Carlo simulation. Between the box and the red line, there are eight sigma difference. So, so, so you, you can see the discrepancy is uh, pretty big. Uh, it basically means uh, if the theory is actually here, the probability is uh, 10 to minus uh, 13 or some, something. So then uh, what's happening? Does the theory run or does the experiment run? Now, uh, uh, we have our bootstrap result, which is this small island. Uh, and. Uh, uh, Remember, the bootstrap result is rigorous. 
That means outside the island, it's completely ruled out. It's impossible to, to be here. Therefore, we confirm the, uh, the Monte Carlo result is okay. Uh, so what's happened to the experiment? Uh, we actually looked at the experiment uh, um, data and uh, I think they underestimated the error bar. So uh, if you are an experimentalist, maybe, uh, maybe you want to revisit the, uh, the, the original data to see what's happened. Um, and for the O3, we can also uh, learn some interesting thing. So uh, O3 model in the continuum limit is described by the phi four Lagrangian. Uh, we can actually add a term to it. Uh, this term break O3 symmetry to discrete symmetry S3 uh, direct product uh, Z2 to the power three. So this symmetry is called the qubit symmetry because it's uh, the symmetry of the cube. And uh, uh, so, so, so now the question is that, uh, is this term relevant or not? Or not? If this term is relevant, then uh, that means uh, O3 model should flow to the qubit model. And uh, uh, this also relates to the real physics. Uh, term like this can be generically generated in uh, lattice. For example, for this material uh, at the structural uh, uh, phase transition, uh, this term can, can appear. So the question is that uh, the, uh, the structural phase transition of material like this, the phase transition is, is described, described, described by O3 or the qubit model. So if uh, this term is uh, uh, relevant, then the phase transition should be described, described, described by qubit model. If it's relevant, then it should be uh, O3 universality class. Okay. Now in our study, we can actually find the upper bound for this uh, operator and uh, we find it's relevant. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, rigorous. That means if this operator is larger than such value, we can rigorously rule out the possibility. Uh, so, so now we have a numerical proof. O3 is actually unstable against the qubit model. Uh, so this is the summary of those uh, uh, results. And, uh, and by the way, uh, now it's actually very easy to reproduce our result. I, I wrote a package called SimpleBoot. Uh, and uh, if, you use, if, you, if you can install this package, then it's very easy to reproduce all those results. Uh, so what's next? I, I showed you we, uh, we made some progress and uh, we, uh, those progress uh, have interesting application in condensed matter. But uh, uh, why we stopped at O3? There are so many interesting phase transition problems in condensed matter physics. So why don't we study it? Well, the problem is that uh, uh, to study more and more complicated CFT, we have to mix more and more operators. And then the scan problem become more and more challenging. So surface cutting algorithm only solve one, or one or part of the problem. It solves the scan problem in the OP space, but it does not solve the scan problem in the delta space. So uh, we want something new. We want to upgrade our arsenal uh, from the bomb to the precision guided missile. We want to do uh, uh, something like gradient descent. We want to uh, do the test at some, some point and we want a function to tell us which direction we should go. So we want a cost function defined in the parameter space. And uh, uh, when we minimize this cost function, we can, from, uh, we can go from the excluded region to the feasible region. So, uh, if we, we have something like this, 
then uh, we can solve the uh, strain problem generated. So uh, this is our latest work done uh, a few months ago. Uh, in indeed, we can do that. So uh, now we can say here, uh, I tested a few points for the icing model. So the icing island is actually uh, here. This is uh, the icing island. And uh, we figured out a way to define the cost function. We call it uh, the navigate function. And uh, uh, after each uh, test, uh, we can compute the gradient of the navigate function. And that tells us which direction we should go in order to reach the island. So after some number of steps, uh, you can say, uh, you can say everything reaches the island. And actually, uh, this point is the most convergent point of the island. So it's, it's the most uh, probable point for the CFT data. Um, OK, so uh, with th this new technique, uh, uh, now we are uh, ready to explore more difficult problems, like the qubit model. So it is still a QD family on QQD and uh, there are many interesting problems to do. And uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ning, for this wonderful talk. Are there any questions? So I have a few questions. Um, so on the one hand, do you expect that these CFT islands are connected? Would you expect to have different pieces? I mean, from, from the examples that you showed, they're always just one, a single island that's a connected uh, region. Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, it's an interesting question. So, uh, so in this plot, uh, I only showed uh, a small part of the picture. Actually, mm -hmm. there's a large continent here. So if you go right hand side, uh, uh, actually there is a large visible region. Uh, the reason is that uh, in, to obtain this island, we assumed some condition. But those conditions are compatible with ice model, but also compatible with more, more models. So, uh, so, so now for this setup, we can isolate ice model from uh, a lot of other models. So actually, there is a large uh, feasible region. The interesting question is that uh, uh, can we find a setup such as that those islands are isolated one by one? So this is actually the, the in some sense, it's the final goal of the conform bootstrap. Basically, we try to use conform bootstrap to classify 3D CFT. So ye, ye, yes, that's our dream. We want to find the uh, all the island. Mm -hmm. And how sure are you that so once you isolated an island like this, how sure are you that there is actually something inside? Because from what I understand, you exclude everything outside of the island. But are you sure mm. there is something inside? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, this is related good to the question. To what you uh, last slide so, covering? So so. So, so eventually we want to uh, solve the bootstrap equation. Uh, if we can find this alpha, uh, uh, there is a way to reconstruct the OP coefficient and the delta uh, on the boundary. So, so if we are on the boundary of the island, we can actually reconstruct the, uh, uh, the safety data, but only approximately. So uh, therefore, if you look at those delta, uh, if it looks uh, make sense, uh, uh, not, not just uh, those uh, operator you stem, but uh, for all the operator appear in the OP, if you look at those OP, uh, those OP coefficient and the delta, if it looks make sense, then uh, it's likely the safety exists. But of course, uh, uh, for, for, for bootstrap, the infeasibility is rigorous, but the feasibility is not rigorous. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and the final question that I had was, uh, so if you go to the, to the gradient descent story that you had, um, are you doing something like reinforcement learning when you when you try to shoot into these islands? Uh, 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 here, actually not. Uh, we use the uh, BFTS uh, algorithm. Uh, the, the, the reason is that uh, uh, in this study, we actually find a very cheap way to compute the gradient of the cost function. Basically, uh, to, to obtain the gradient, we don't need to do uh, a new computation. We basically, we have a short formula. You can just read off the gradient. So for, it's very suitable for BFTS. And uh, it's uh, probably more efficient for uh, than reinforced learning. The, the reason is that uh, this, this surface is uh, is uh, pretty singular. Uh, so outside the, the island, the number is uh, around the order one. So it's a normal number. But inside the island, it could be 10 to minus uh, 10. And when you increase the number of derivative, if when you increase the uh, dimension of the vectors, the, the dimension of the vector space, uh, the cost function inside the island will get smaller and smaller. It could be something like 10 to minus uh, 40. Uh, and uh, that is expected because this function essentially measure how much the bootstrap application is not satisfied. So mm -hmm. as you increase uh, the precision, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the equation should be satisfied more and more accurate. Mm -hmm. So it's a big, uh, big scale. Big, between outside the island and the inside the island. It seems uh, the, this kind of thing uh, is a little bit uh, not good for reinforced learning, which is uh, usually double precision. Okay, oh, thank you very much. Are there any other questions for Ning? If not, let's thank him again for this wonderful talk. Thank you.